Now, when we start talking, on the other hand, in terms of disruptions, the way we change things, and it could be slow paced, which was earlier the perspective, or it could be something which will shake the market. The way iPhones shook the market in terms of mobility, the way Uber has changed the way we look at transportation today. Those are changes which have put paid to earlier models. How many of you still call for a cab? Or how many of you go on to a web application and request a cab? We mostly have those apps on our phone, and we request it in an anonymous way. I put in my starting point. I put in my destination. I'm done. I will have a cab coming to me with a time plan specified, fairly accurate, plus or minus a few minutes. And in Bangalore, those few minutes could go into a few tens of minutes also. Keep that in mind. Unpredictability side of that. But that is what is disruption. It is no longer the former definition of slow-paced disruption. It is more like some new entrant in the market who has disrupted my business, I need to figure out what to do with my business. If I remember early days getting to uh, the airport in Bangalore, we used to have Meru and such participants. Now, I don't even call a Meru. Only people who are using the Meru is from airport to somewhere else. And that's close to what we are at. They have been totally disrupted. Ola has taken over the market. These are the kind of changes which are happening. These are the kind of changes which we have to work with. So that is why when we look at the combination of these two words, I'm still with English, the combination of these two words is fast-paced, drastic change, in our business environments. How do we look at those kind of fast changes? Let me take a few examples onto that. The few examples come to mind, and these are some of the areas which I have picked up which are close to the technology perspective. I have not looked at some of the others. I will talk a little bit about them. IBM, 1990s, they started walking away from the hardware business. They introduced a totally new set of services, software services, consulting services. They have gone on to platform services and equivalent. This was something which created a huge change and a huge upheaval for IBM. There's a counterpart. And the reason I have picked this counterpart also is because of certain reasons. How many of you know what is the origin of Nokia? What business were they in? Pulp and paper. This is an organization which is more than 150 years old. When you look at their perspective, they started in 1865. Pulp, paper. From pulp and paper, they had a change of the original founders, and they got into electricity generation. Because one of the original founders was not happy with electricity generation. The moment he moved out, the second founder decided they wanted to get into electric generation. By chance, a co-located company in the same location, which came about a few years later, got them into cables, because that company was into rubber and rubber products started a new line of business. Only in 1960s, they started getting into devices which are electrical, electronic devices. How many years later? 100 years later. That change from multiple business streams for them came over a very slow-paced, opportunistic changes, not changes which IBM faced, which were forced from the external pressure. These were internally driven changes. 
By 1990s, Nokia got rid of all their other businesses and they started focusing purely on telecommunications. So for the last 30 years, and they're still not dead, in fact, they are one of the rare companies which have successfully, as far back as three, four years back, tested out a complete live 5G network. They are working with Docomo in Japan. They have launched those 5G networks, and that is the kind of changes they are bringing about. Part of the handsets which they had, that side is gone. They're still there, but that has become a minor part of their business. They are still into telecommunications. They have done that kind of a change over the last few years because of business pressures, but earlier change has been from inside. That is the difference between these two. One change brought about by external pressures, done over time hurriedly because you don't have too much reaction time. Second, Nokia, which took 100 plus years to do the change. That is inside out. Now, we don't look at the luxury of 100 plus years. But both these bring about a kind of a business perspective change. I'm just taking a few examples. I have not. I could have covered five different slides, talked about each one of them. But I have just taken a different perspective. What has the net, what has the communication speeds brought about is Netflix. Netflix is web-based, other than in India. In India only, they have launched a different service very recently, which is only mobile-based because of the consumption patterns they have seen. They have changed that format. They have brought about that add-on to their business. But the way they have revolutionized the kind of media streaming, the kind of entertainment perspective, what have they run it on? Pure technology. With Geo coming in, now there's going to be a different ball game altogether. Because that's going to give a lot of heart attacks to some of the brick and mortar perspectives. How is that going to change? Let's wait for next two or three months and we will start seeing, uh, maybe another six months, we will start seeing the impact onto that. Anybody recognize what is this? Pilotless vehicles, driverless vehicles. While this is still being tested, there are other examples which are remotely controlled vehicles which have become day-to-day -day activities. And I believe we have seen all of these at least one or multiple times in our life, in our recent years. How are the drones getting used? At the bare minimum, I have seen the drones being used for weddings, video capture, even in functions like this or gatherings like this. It is being used actively. And that is the kind of difference which has brought about. This is already an approved technology, soft approved. Most countries are still trying to figure out or grappling with how should they regulate this technology. It's very difficult to do. But this is one short form of drones. There are much bigger drones which are used in defense establishments. And they have become a standard part of any country's repertoire, arsenal. I have talked only of technology driven. I can take example from my own organization and my parent organization, which shifted from pure tobacco in 1970s. 50 years later, tobacco is not the largest part necessarily of our portfolio. We have become a FMCG. Difference. Where did all these items come from? And that change is not technology driven, that change interestingly is market opportunity driven. Whether we got into food products, whether we got into personal care, whether we got into working with the villages, that's what ITC today is. So these are the kind of changes. What has changed? Every such change 
is either driven by a market shattering change, which for IBM, it was becoming a question in terms of what is their identity? Hardware business is dying away. 90s, we started hearing a lot about mainframes dying away uh, with the kind of Y2K around the corner. They had to look at changing their perspective because times were changing, servers were becoming more efficient, smaller servers were becoming more efficient. All the others are also inside out. So this is where I'm talking about a different perspective. Outside in, I'm cornered. I don't have a choice. I have to redefine my business structure. Inside out takes a lot more doing. It's inherently very risky. And that risk needs to be looked at in terms of how do you look at capturing that kind of a perspective, capturing and triggering that kind of a perspective. Now, one of the things which I inherently believe in, and that's my request to all VAs and business consultants, have the courage. Have the courage to talk about your ideas. You'll get beaten up, no doubt about it, because people don't like change. But over time, those ideas start becoming mainstream. Small percentage of it, who knows, it might be your idea. Have the courage, you will get beaten up. But there's no shortage of that. If you live by those ethos, that is one of the driving factors for us as business analysts. And as I get into my next stage, which is how do I look at such change coming about? Each of these four stages for me is critical. I have taken certain elements across from how technology becomes mainstream, how technology gets leveraged, and for me, and from a business analyst perspective, for me, these four steps are very critical into any of the things which we end up doing. These four steps, for me, define how do I create trouble. Because I'm looking at inside out transformation, in that sense, what am I looking at? I'm looking at creating trouble for the competitors. That's a different item. 50% of the time I get into creating trouble for others, it boomerangs back onto me. But that's, that's the law of averages. And that's fun to handle. Because at times, when you create trouble and it boomerangs onto you, you are probably the best person who's done enough work on that to be able to handle that trouble. Think of the competitors on whom we unveil some of these changes. I'm not talking anything different. These are simple words. These are words which we are used to. What is the essence behind that is what I'm talking about. What is the essence behind that? According to me, and this was a small conversation we were having last evening, there was a term which was called BAU. What would BAU stand for? Is it relevant today? From us as business analysts, it's a fossil. It's already history. Because by the time the BAU gets into production side, by the time my business users are able to leverage it, it's already become history. It's already out of date. It's already out of time. My perspective is very simple. BAU no longer holds its place. If I am converting any of the things, any of my current activities, which are BAU, onto system leveraged without adding drastic amount of value, by the time my business users start using it, it's dead. And that is why we end up into trouble of having change requests coming up. Having change requests coming up every few weeks. I'm not even talking months. Every few weeks, change requests coming up. That is where the stage one in terms of how do we look at ideas? How do we look at generating those ideas? One of the things, when we conduct any kind of a focus group, 
any kind of such session where ideation is going on. Remember, we as BAs have done, have had the luxury also to do some level of research to understand what is current environment, what could be some of the changes which are happening on the horizon more than any of the other participants. We are in a best position to understand what people are talking as part of those ideation sessions. Keep that in mind. What does that do? We are also in a position to start taking ideas which we did not think of. We can't think of all the ideas ourselves, which we did not think of. Somebody comes up with a snippet of idea. Somebody else comes up with another snippet of idea. But we are in a position to stitch it together to generate new ideas. And when we start talking on to that, we are talking some of the elements, whether we are doing mind mapping, whether we are doing brainstorming, storyboarding, role plays, all these elements come into play. Each one of them has their own pros, own cons. We use them in different situations. Don't worry. The basic element is, are we coming up with strong ideas coming out of those sessions, how many of those strong ideas are going to get converted into workable prototypes? And we are still talking at a high level. We are still looking at which could be the viable ideas. I'm just using one of the terms here, which is design thinking. There are a lot more similar exercises and uh, uh, available approaches. There is no limitation. Whatever we get comfortable with organizing and being able to run. Initially, we might start off being a participant in those sessions, but each of us needs to generate that capability to be able to run some of those smaller sessions. That's a critical skill for us to be able to leverage, to be able to carry out. That's something which is going to make a lot of difference to how we operate as business analysts. We have the high level concept. We have a user interface which we displayed as part of the idea. What's going on behind that user interface? How do I connect the different phases of that user interface across to something which will flow seamlessly from one part of the user interface to the next user interface? Every stage, even when we are in an agile environment or we are still in some of the older waterfall environments, the detailing from that idea to an actual working model, which is practical working, which is going to stand on its own, still is critical. I've been through a stage where, and this was something like eight or nine years back, one of our clients asked, and those were the days where dashboards were being talked about. We created a set of dashboards based on what data they were looking at. We were doing that, and the only thing which I went back to my data team was something very different. These are the dashboard concepts which we have created. Your set of tools which you are using, which of these can be delivered by those tools which cannot be? They came back only with one visualization which they could not deliver from the tools they were doing. We created a nice prototype for the customer. We displayed it to the customer only in sessions. Nobody from our customer, and I will give it in writing, understood this was a PowerPoint with hyperlinks. That was the prototype. That was the prototype. Because I was displaying it, I knew exactly where my hyperlink was. I just had to click on that. It will move to the next visual. I could move from a single slide to five different visuals. And my customer was happy. I'm clicking here. It's taking me to the detailing of this data into five other pieces of data with all the graphs and uh, bar charts. I go on to a different this thing. It's detailing the detailed data onto that. A fun. They were very impressed. Those were the days of dashboarding. But how to achieve it from that prototype, which was purely PowerPoint based, to actual working this thing, how the requirements would work out, still had to be worked out. These were some of the tricks which we have used which we continue to use. 
It's only dependent on our ingenuity. Only on the prototyping side also. I'm talking about the ideas. And I'm talking about seven, eight years back when dashboarding was still very little. Initial people were doing all that. This is where the detailing goes in. If we go into Agile, we might detail only one section of it. Or we might detail three, four different sections of it in three, four parallel paths, take them into different scrums, build up those sections. There are pros and cons across both. Uh, we have to be careful in terms of how my detailing is not going to destroy the fabric of the overall perspective. That is critical. Question which comes are the last two critical items. What is the information which is going to get generated? What is the information which is going to be available from outside my system? What is the information which is going to be available from outside my system from the organization versus the entire internet? How do I combine and leverage that information into sensible outcomes? Sensible outcomes which for any user is going to give a better next step instead of taking the data to another piece, analyzing it, it's giving me that rework data. So in the previous session, we were talking about data science. There was one question which was raised. Does a data scientist need to understand statistics? I know it's a dreaded word. It's a dreaded word which most of us don't like. The difference which has happened today, earlier, we had a set of data. Sorry, I'm digressing, but it's just for 30 seconds. We had a set of data. And from that set of data, we had to figure out, is this data amenable to a normal distribution, a linear distribution, a Poisson distribution? Today's tools take that set of data. They don't ask for which distribution I have to align this data to. They will give me the output based on its own internal workings. So the tools have advanced. I don't need to know the theory of a lot of different distributions on statistics. I still need to know how to use the output of those in knowledgeable manner. So that is where these two items, what is the information availability? What can I analyze it to give what level of an end result to my user? And my user could be a business user, could be a retail user. For my retail user, it could as easily be, this is the next recommendation for you, whether it's Netflix, whether it's Amazon, whether it's uh, any of these, these things. Or for a business user, it could be highlighting, these are the two green spots in your performance for the last two weeks. This is the one red spot where all of a sudden the performance has dipped, and these are the indicators of that performance dipping. This is another potential red spot which is coming up because based on leading indicators, this is potentially going to become a red spot in another two months. That is the power of analytics. What am I giving? I'm giving all those inputs to my business user very quickly. That is one of the items which has to go into detailing my requirements. If data is oil, it's required everywhere. However, there is a big danger. The danger is of skidding on that oil. If we don't leverage the data properly, if we don't leverage it meaningfully, that data has become junk. And that is why these two steps are so critical onto the environment which I'm talking about. What am I doing? I'm converting a two-page storyboard into a full 16 to 32 page comic strip. That is critical. I'm going through the each and every step, teaching it as if it is I'm teaching a baby. I'm again going back to the last section from Accenture. Remember, they talked about four things as the challenges onto the data. And I noted it down very clearly because I wanted to reference it back. What is the understanding 
of the business. That comes from ideation perspective. If that is not there, I cannot run that kind of ideation and prototyping session. Second item, what is the level of management support? I have to still figure out a way to tie it to how we are doing the detailing on requirements, but those are some of the items. Third was collaboration. This is where collaboration starts coming. Every time we have highlighted, a business analyst does not need to become a coder, but has to understand what is the power of technology. We have highlighted it again and again. We have heard it from different people again and again. It is far more truer today than what was 10 years back. Why? My previous step in terms of detailing the requirements and the leverage of technology have to actually go hand in hand. They cannot be segregated from each other. They are required because at times, a technology perspective makes a kind of a approach feasible, which in the absence of that technology, I could not put in my requirements. There are times I have drawn up the requirements and I had to go and change it because technology could not deliver that. So our understanding of the technology is critical. Not only that, there's a value for us to understand what is the role of a technical architect. How do I leverage that knowledge? Whom do I team up with? Who are the potential group of people I team up with? That level of collaboration is critical. That level of activity is required because that is something which will make the entire ideation the detailing of the requirements, feasible. This is the feasibility. If this feasibility is not established, no level of solutions will work. Today, technology is far ahead, but the choices are also so many more. If there are so many more, we have to look at what is going to be the right choice. Am I in a position to make the right choice? Maybe not. Am I in a position to narrow down the number of choices? Absolutely, yes. Can I do that before I take it to the technical architect? If I go with 10 choices, say, sorry, I don't have time to go through all this. I don't have time to analyze this. I've got far more important things to do. When I go with three choices and ask clearly, give me your recommendation for this kind of environment, I'm far more liable to get coherent responses because I have given a small set of choices. And it works with human nature. Through all these steps, please understand human natures. Please understand how human mind works. Please understand what is the psychology behind some of the things. And I'll take the simplest of the examples. You're given two MCQs. How many times have you turned around and said, on this particular multiple choice, there is one choice which is far more apt, which is missing. And I have penciled that in, that this is a better choice. Have we done that? Why? Our thought process is already limited by the number of choices which is shown to us. That is human nature. So what we do as judgment onto initially going through some of the choices is very critical. If we have doubts, let's go and get somebody else. Let's go and ask those questions. We might sound very foolish, but I better be ready to be sounding foolish than to have ignored a very viable option, which could have made a far more powerful solution or a far more powerful approach. I'm, I will take the risk of sounding foolish. At the same time, I want to take the risk of saying, this is something which will shake your world this is a different idea. Are you ready to do that? So technology side is one of the criticals. And that is why the help with the research is required, because I need to narrow down the kind of choices before I go and ask somebody for help. The research is also 
for my own knowledge. Again, I'm not doing coding, but I'm understanding what is the leverage of technology. Today, technology drives a lot of things. Last item, and this is by far the weakest link into the entire cycle. Remember the fourth item which Accenture put up. What is the success rate? Is it right for the business? Is business ready to accept it? And there are ways around that. When I bring in a drastic change, people don't like it. The first, the first reaction we ourselves have to any drastic change which is suggested to us as people, us as an individual, is, sorry, it does not agree with what I have seen so far, it will not work. We never look at it for this kind of a change to work. What are the other 10 things which have to be working with me to be able to bring about that change? So the change management does not start after I have done all the ideation. Remember, in the first stage of ideation, we expose people to multiple ideas. Some of the people generated their own ideas. Identify the champions. Whose idea was it which got selected or which, had, which contributed to the final idea? Use them as champions. They will propagate their idea. It's in their vested interest. This was my idea. It's something which will add this benefit, this benefit, this benefit, and all that. Use them, leverage them. It's ego, human ego which is at work. That human ego starts making a lot of difference. Leverage that. However, any change requires time. So if I'm bringing about a change, I have to start talking about it over coffee conversations, over break time conversations. Get some people to, and it's not only doing a hard push at that. It's only asking questions, asking soft this thing. Will this kind of a thing make sense? These are simple questions. They are not coercive questions. They are simple asking for feedback. This is a technique which over the years we have used actively in consulting. Before the consultant's final presentation goes on in front of the entire audience who are the stakeholders, over time and over the previous two days, three days, as consultants, what will we do? We will take snippets of that idea to different people on small conversations. Get the feedback. It's supposedly get the feedback. The reality behind that is we are exposing them to those new ideas ahead of time. So when in a final day that goes on in a presentation, out of a group of 20 people audience, if you see the nod of heads, of five of them, you have already broken the res collective resistance of that group. Because five people are nodding on that idea. Yes, it makes sense. Why does it make sense? Because they have heard it before. Because they have liked that approach. They have had time to sleep over it. It's subconscious. It's not a conscious, this thing that they have agreed with it, but they have heard it before. Who's planted that thought? over the previous few days of conversation. And this is one of the most common tricks across consulting which has been used over the years. It's a trick which is still very relevant. Get those champions. More than those champions. Partners. Who are your partners? Once you have got the core group agreement, you need to get the wider group to buy into that idea, to get exposed to that idea. Small mailers, a small poster put up somewhere else. One of the biggest partners I have leveraged over the years is a small marketing team. It does not go from me, it's coming from somewhere else. Somebody else has given that idea. It's a small message which goes out. It starts driving that change across a broader group. What are we leveraging? We are leveraging the power of technology as it's available for social media, but in a smaller group. 
can I create a small 30 second video and share it across a larger group? 30 second video people will watch. If you create it as a three minute video, your number of people who are ready to watch it will drop to one fourth. And these are statistics which are available. Now what is the difference between 30 seconds to 180 seconds is losing 75% of your audience. So you have to look at how simple your message is and how amenable my target people are to even open that video. We get all different videos on our uh, WhatsApp and all, right? How many of them we don't bother watching? A lot of them. 30 seconds, okay, let's see what it is. It's not going to take too much. It's a five minute video. Do I want to devote that time? Do I want to wait for a few more minutes before that video downloads also? So you see again the human perspective. And this is what is critical. When I talk about is market the change. Forcing the change does not happen. With people like me who have kids, we have learned it the hard way. Fighting with our kids, trying to force them into doing something. You try to market them and use the entire approach of giving four options, that these are the four more likely options. Think about it. They will come back with one of those choices. What have you done smartly? You have seeded the thought into their mind and you have limited their horizon. That works while marketing it. That incidentally, don't ever try it in the ideation phase. The two perspectives are very different. But these are critical items when we start looking at the entire success. And I'm going and leveraging back onto the last session which we were talking about what are the four biggest challenges which we have seen. Our understanding of the business, the buy-in of the powers that be, the collaboration amongst the team, and whether business is going to accept it. These four slides are actually structured at that, and I did not change these slides after their session. Incidentally, that's, that's the kind of convergence which is happening. These four talk only of that. I'm just trying to look at as to what are those drivers. These drivers are simplistic in nature. To bring them into practice, we ourselves have to be ready to adhere to some of these thoughts. None of these are prescriptive. prescriptive. They are all simple approaches which we all use day in, day out in different forms. Are we making sure we are using the best possible mix of that? That is the critical difference. And that is the critical difference in terms of bringing about a major change versus doing small changes which incidentally for our industry and for a lot of other industries is already becoming a challenge and has already become a fossil. That is the word BAU. I don't agree with that word BAU anymore. For the simple reason, time is not in our favor. The kind of changes which happen so fast, by the time we do the BAU, history. This is what I was talking about. But there are two things which I would like to emphasize on again as I come to a close on to this discussion. Item number one, what is the courage we carry with us to talk about a drastically different idea? To talk about a sea change in the way today others understand how these things should be done. And that is a disruptive change. Disruptive change does not come about because somebody else's idea is there. Why shouldn't it be my idea? But that requires a little bit of extra courage to be ready to get beaten up. One of the things I keep emphasizing again and again, folks, please be ready to get beaten up. You will take a few beatings, but in the end, it will make you a far more effective business person. I'm not talking only as a business analyst. I'm talking about more effective as a business person. More in tune with 
ability to change and evolve because that is our environment today. The second perspective which I'm going to talk about and I'm going to spend another 30 seconds to uh, 60 seconds onto that, there's been a lot of argument in terms of what is business analysis, what is business consulting. All these four items which I've talked about, any of these are business analysis. But they're also based on to business consulting perspective. The only difference between the two, the way I look at it, can I gather a wider variety of exposure to move from something which is a designation called business analysis to a business consulting? There's a huge lot of difference. And the difference is not too much. These are not contradictory statements. As I look at it, we keep collecting snippets of information. If we are collecting those snippets of information, we are building our own repository of ideas. We are building our own repository of reactions which people have. We are building our own ways of what could change, what could not change, what somebody else has tried under what circumstances which has succeeded or failed. We are building that up. What does the business consultant bring? To the best of the ability the business consultant brings is one key element. The ability to probe somebody else's thoughts and minds. That's one key skill of a business consultant. Don't we do that as part of our requirements? No longer are the requirements given to us in writing or as dictated to us. We have to keep probing, keep doing more. We're detailing out certain ideas, certain details. From our business user perspective, from our focus group participants perspective, from the people who are actually doing role plays, we are creating those environments where we are able to observe and look at how their minds are working. Then it comes my ability, can I combine all those reads which I have taken, the verbal and the non-verbal, and combine them into areas which start making a story. It could come from different people. A business consultant is expert at probing those minds. A business consultant brings that skill in. We as business analysts already have that skill as part of our entire grounding in terms of how do we probe. Let's liberate that. So this, is, this has been a continuing discussion and argument over the years in terms of these two communities. I had to fight a lot within our organization also to look at what is the growth path from business analysis to business consulting. And it's a very smooth path. The bigger block, there are external ones, but at least what we have to do is remove our own internal mental blocks onto that. This is where I wanted to make those two points very clearly because this is part of that thought process. And if this is the part of those thought processes, I'm looking at just going back to that one slide, which I will leave it at uh, before I ask for questions onto that. And I know I'm already out of time. So but in case we don't uh, have those questions uh, in this session, uh, we will, uh, you can catch hold of me outside. Uh, I'm just taking care of a lot of practical perspectives onto this. Simple thoughts, more importantly, is the criticality of how do we apply these. So open for questions, open for thoughts. I've gotten people ready for lunch already. All the effect of coffee has worn out. Hi, uh, I'm Kirti. 
uh, you were talking about lot about uh, ideation uh, things. So we are also doing kind of uh, sandbox and ideation things. Uh, in most of the time when we see uh, after completing the ideation, when we go for a real MVP or uh, at times it doesn't uh, actually work. So what is your take on like how do you see uh, the ideation working and when we go to the real production of like uh, the incubation or MVP, it fails sometimes. So what's your take on this? What's your experience on this? I look at it from two different perspectives. One, as part of the ideation group, have we gotten a good cross-section of people into that session? A lot of times we will get the power users into that. Have we got a good cross-section? Because the ideas which come across that cross-section are useful. Second, is in terms of no single idea necessarily works from across all the ideation sessions. Typically we have to look at is can I take different snippets of ideas from different uh, teams which have gotten together for ideation and combine them into far more powerful multi-idea sessions. Those, that groundwork or that intermediate work. First is the groundwork in terms of making sure having a cross-section of people available. Second is the intermediate work from those ideas to create a further set of downstream ideas, which could be combinations across the things. And that is why as part of the ideation session, we insist on when one team is presenting, all the other teams are away from their work tables and clustered around the team which is presenting. Because that is where the teams will pick up the ideas from others, and when they are talking about their idea, they might bring certain snippets of those ideas from the other team into the narration which they do. Those two are critical in terms of realizing to a better set of ideas which might be feasible. Thank you. regarding the IBM example which you showed. So IBM moved from hardware to services to catch up with the market, but there was a good potential for them because they were the leaders in hardware. They could have gone to the cloud. They could have been the leaders in the cloud. What stopped them? Why didn't they think about it? I think part of, uh, part of the activity was also uh, we were still focused in IBM, and uh, when I'm talking we, I'm talking from an IBM perspective. Uh, we were still focused on to very limited set of hardwares, very powerful. They were far ahead of all the other hardware manufacturers at that time. When you're talking in 1980s to 1990s, they were far ahead of that. But those were already running their course. They had to re-engineer their entire set of hardware to come out with a class. Would they be ahead of the curve of the Suns in the HPs at that time, or the DEC, which were there at that time as competitors, because one was coming from one side, these were coming from grounds up perspective. Would they be ahead of the curve or ahead of the advantage compared to these? They had to re engineer a lot of their architectures. Because now they're using the same thing which they had then to get onto cloud. It's like a catch up game. Catch -up. So, cloud as a concept came about differently. Yeah, they Cloud as a concept came around because of a different challenge as I understand it. And these are my thoughts on to that. When we started moving into smaller servers, we started looking at how do I look at these servers which are granular in nature and I want to harness their power. That is where the entire concept of virtualization came about. Once that virtualization within the data center was achieved, it was an easier leap to do that virtualization across data centers. As a concept, that is where the cloud concept started off. So it was not something which was germinated at 2002, 2003, 4. That was the time when virtualization initially picked up the initial concept, but it germinated over time from that. Even in 
five and six when Google was having those big data centers, I think IBM was not ready to move, maybe because of the size? So different thought processes. By that time, all, IBM had already made a success of their services and consulting and all that. They had a name, they leveraged that name and they leveraged that brand. Again, to do that change, see, any drastic change results in a lot of cost. It results in some level of bloodshed also, where the organization mindset has to change. Some people will exit, new people will come in, but it changes the fabric of the organization. Yes. Do you think these new companies like Google and all, they don't mind, they are really taking, taking more risks than those old? The way these guys are going ahead and the way these guys are innovating, it's fantastic. Some new startup might come and take off from where they have already reached. Remember, a lot of Google ideas are out in public. So somebody else might build a different building on top of that, which could be a different viewpoint altogether. So it's not out of the possible scenarios. It's something feasible, absolutely. And that is what we are relying on for this changing environment in this world. That is what gives the entire IT industry a challenge and a perspective to grow further. That is where the pace is different. And this is the fun of being in this industry. Okay, thank you very much.